Ladies and gentlemen, in his last artistic phase, Pablo Picasso successfully transposed some of his folded sheet metal sculptures into large-scale art objects placed in landscape and urban context. And it was possible thanks to Carl Nessier, a Norwegian artist who developed a dedicated technique of concrete preparation called Betograve. And the bust of a woman, which was to be erected after 1971, was a crowning project of that phase and Picasso's life. The sculpture, had it been materialized, would have been twice the size of any other of Picasso's works and the world's largest concrete monument at that time. And the bust was intended to be 100 feet high and sit in the USF University of South Florida campus. Unfortunately, the idea encountered some financial difficulties, was put on hold and eventually canceled. After 50 years, the abandoned project offers faint material legacy kept in the special collection library at the USF, including a wooden model of the sculpture, drawings, photo montages, clippings from the USF Chronicle and local newspapers, and some photographs. So first, I will discuss the provenance of the bust and introduce you to Karnesiar and his Betograve method. Next, I will present my methodology, including 3D digitization and modeling, virtual reconstruction of sculptures, um, context and its background. And then I will discuss how the intended sculpture location was determined for the use of augmented reality. And I will conclude with discussing that um, rather benefits of incorporating digital methods into collection preservation and art historical research. A small scale folded metal sheet bust of a woman, the original one, is 12 inches high, has four principal surfaces to create an abstract sculpture of a female head, upper chest, arms and hands. The bust belongs to a series of folded metal cutouts, mostly white with limited decorations. And the bust is almost a twin of the sculpture of a woman from 1961, held here in Museo Picasso in Malaga. And according to John Richardson, Picasso profited from his juvenile games in later life when he put his scissors to the most inventive use for paper sculpture of cubism, and in 1950s for the cutout markets. After 1953, Picasso found means of enlarging and solidifying um, small fragile markets by having them cut out in folded, uh, in, sorry, cut out and folded in sheet metal. But in terms of scale, that was not enough for the artist. And as Alfred H. Barr puts it. Picasso began to dream of colossal sculptures. And according to Douglas Cooper, in many periods of his life, Picasso had the good fortune to encounter some artist, artisan, or technician who at the right moment has put the tools of a new medium in, into his hands or offered to help him realize a half-formed project of his own. And in this case, the helping hands belonged to Carnesier who was working with sandblasting technique called Betograve. Why Sally Feywader discusses in her book um, in detail the collaboration between Picasso and Nessier, she does not provide information on, on the beginnings of this joint work. And this was, however, possible through the digitization of, of um, old recordings on a set of reel-to-reel -reel tapes held in the USF library, which include an interview with Nessier from 1974. And this is how we learn 
that Nessier was introduced to Picasso by Fiedler, Eugene Fiedler, a close friend of Picasso with whom he occasionally worked together on ceramics. And Fiedler, who already knew Nessier's concrete works, encouraged the Norwegian to show photographs of his Oslo sculptures to Picasso, and Picasso's reaction to Nessier's presentation was explosive. As Nessier recalls, Picasso gazed for a long time at the photographs, then hid the chair and started screaming with enthusiasm. He ran into the kitchen and enthusiastically explained the technique to the cook. She told him that he had lost his mind. He returned from the kitchen but was still too excited to sit down, so he passed his guest and went outside to the gardener in the garden to talk to him about concrete. Eventually, they agreed that Nessier would use a few of Picasso's unsight um, drawings as a template for some blasting experiments, and Picasso, in turn, would accept or reject the attempts, and this is how the collaboration started. Eventually, between 1956 and 1973, they created 15 sandblasting works and nine murals in the United States, Norway, Spain, Sweden, France, Israel, and the Netherlands. This was possible thanks to Bettergrave. At that time, a novel and inexpensive concrete sculpting method. This method requires that a dry, white um, aggregate is packed densely into forms and a white liquid binding agent is then forced under pressure into the forms and after drying, the forms are stripped away and the surface is sandblasted to achieve white finish texture. I digitized the wooden model of the bust uh, to digitally um, preserve the object held at the USF library and to recreate the sculpture with intended measurements. I also aim to emplace it in the contemporary campus and in its 1970s counterpart to analyze and understand Picasso's original concept and to disseminate the outputs by means of augmented reality. To create a digital twin, I used soft bench photogrammetry and laser scanners the shiny white surface of the bust and its complex, really complex, geometry were a challenge for 3D digitization. And why the surface reflects light, causing distortions in photographs, I used um, Faro measuring arm, which does not record texture, to get geometric details of the cutouts. And in addition, I used also blue scanner, blue light scanner, to minimize wide reflectance and record texture data. And thus, the impact of reflectance was limited, and the scanner delivered precise geometry measurements. I integrated the outputs to see that some edges and narrow angles between cutouts and folded surfaces were still poorly recorded, which is illustrated uh, here with white, uh, sorry, with yellow. And as a result, I used the integrated outputs to digitally sculpt the missing parts, after which I unified all components and assessed the geometry and integrity of the model by printing it in 3D. And to create the bust virtually, I had to consider how its elements would have looked like after the enlargement process. I identified that the wooden model of the bust held in the USF library is more robust with thicker surfaces and deeper cutouts than, than the original sculpture. And this is most likely because of the construction reasons um, in the plant enlargement process. Uh, it means that Nessier altered the original sculpture while cre crea creating the wooden model. And indeed, we must remember that the bust of a woman originated from a metal sheet sculpture presented in a gallery settings. Thus, both the form and the material had to be transformed to construct a colossal concrete sculpture, which, if constructed, would have reached the shoulder of the Statue of Liberty. As 
ancient Greeks or Henry Matisse remarked, perspective is different and eyes work differently. If you are going for, from 40 inches to 40 feet, then sometimes you really have to make it wrong to make it look right because of the perspective. And indeed, one of construction issues was, as Nessier said, reconciling the aesthetic values inherent in Picasso's original creation with the practical engineering aspects requiring solutions to ensure that the sculpture could be constructed according to specification. And at that time, better grave seemed to be the most suitable method to maintain original stylistic features, but to reflect artistic effects of metal original, that was a challenge. And for instance, while working on Jerusalem's profiles, Nessier changed the proportion and size of cutout spaces, otherwise the object would have fallen down and would, would have never stood up. And in Florida, with its exposure to hurricanes, the 100 feet sculpture requiring 1.5 million pounds of concrete was subject to specific engineering requirements. And again, a balance needed to be struck between the engineering concerns about structural stability and the aesthetics of Picasso's design. And while engineering challenges were expected to make the construction even more expensive, a question was asked whether a 20 feet shorter sculpture could be built significantly, reducing the cost. But this idea was not sanctioned by Picasso's son, Claude. So one may ask why Picasso decided to build his largest sculpture in Florida with devastating hurricanes. Let's leave this question to Nessier to explain. I was kind of a delegate for the university and I went to see Picasso and I showed him photographs and a model of the, the sculptural center which was being planned and he liked the whole idea very much. He liked the architectural part of it and the layout and so forth and that was not the only reason but it was one of the reasons that he said yes because it happens you come to him with a project and he will not like it and he says immediately no. This indicates that the whole project was not only about enlarging the sculpture, but also about the architectural context in which the sculpture was to be a focal point. And unfortunately, none of the archival sources mentioned the name of the architect who might have been responsible for the design. By knowing the architect's portfolio, uh, the virtual reconstruction would be easier and historically verified. And to reconstruct the planned cultural center and test the spatial interaction of the sculpture and its, and, and its environment, I recreated the architecture of the center based on two drawings, several newspapers, uh, newspaper clippings, and a description stating that the 100 feet sculpture would have sat on a plaza 20 feet above ground level. The lower portion of the overall form below the plaza level was planned to be earth covered with grass to produce something like a mountain carved and cut into the plaza with angular shapes for entry. And this information helped me to realize that the building of USF Business College looks very, very much like the planned cultural center. And also the stepped terraces of the center and the business college resemble Paul Rudolph's architectural sketches. While investigating the interior of the business college, I identified that it, is, it also resembled famous staircases characteristic for Paul Rudolph's architecture, who was, um, Paul Rudolph was active in Florida in 1970s and was known for brutalist concrete structures. And the ulti uh, ultimate uh, confirmation for uh, Rudolph's attribution comes from a photograph showing Rudolph's New York penthouse with wooden model of the bust known from the US, US of library sitting in his living room. And these outcomes led me to create a cultural complex virtually, which indeed creates a visually dramatic effect as Picasso intended. And the concrete medium utilized by Picasso and Nessier was to be supplemented by Rudolf's concrete 
brutalist architecture. And the sculpture sitting on the plaza would have um, allowed the complete submerging of one building so that only the upper level levels of the other two buildings would have related visually um, to the bust of a woman. And a concert hall was situated next to the sculpture from which the audience would have spilled out to view the sculpture and surrounding environment for several levels. And a shallow reflection pool on the plaza, which was to mirror and visually enlarge the sculpture, was to drain into a rimmed hole so that the water fell in a cylindrical column to the ground level below. And people circling this water feature would have been able to see the sculpture through this water curtain soaring above the plaza. Magnificent. Certainly the cultural center was designed to create an interaction between buildings and the structure. The model, mm, to model, uh, the, aesthetics, uh, the aesthetic effect and create augmented reality for the, for the architectural complex, it was key to answer the question of where the cultural complex was to be located. While, again, <laughs> None of the av available archival sources uh, clearly presented the intended location of the cultural center. Spatial analysis utilizing several sets of historic aerial photographs and historic maps and estimating visibility and accessibility interactions between known buildings and the proposed sculpture helped to determine the location. The complex was planned for the western part of the campus that is currently used as retention pond and parking. And these outputs were used to create virtual representation of the USF campus, which presents a model version of the area with the sculpture in its place at the time of Picasso's donation, as well as present day scene to estimate the aesthetic effects of the place. And this architectural ambience was virtually recreated and forms part of an augmented reality development in which Picasso's spatial vision has been demonstrated, and this approach provides um, new insights into what the sculpture might have been like if it had been built. As it comes to artistic effects, the extraordinary scale, the cutouts in the monolithic form were a unique aesthetic uh, feature of the bust. The sculpture seemed to have been designed to create um, various effects when seen, seen from different sites and levels. Uh, 3D simulations have helped to identify some of the unexpected structural relations that would have created an impression of light concrete by opening its structure with transparent elements such as glass in the architecture and cutouts in the sculpture. And the shifting sunlight and shadow effects would have changed how the white sunblasted texture would have been seen throughout the day. As the sun rose and set, shadows would have moved over and interplayed with various parts of the sculpture, piercing the cutouts at different angles and changing the sculpture block, the monolithic block, as well as animating its architectural surroundings. The USF board approved the construction um, of the sculpture on 9th April 1973, a day after artist's death, reasoning that Picasso is dead, but his work still lives, and the project will long stand as an example of the best of Picasso's art. Although the project was never realized, digitization and virtualization brought it to life. Combined with traditional art, history research, digital methods help to reconstruct a unique project of Picasso, Nessier, and Rudolf. As discussed, Picasso's concrete monuments were designed for spatial coexistence, with architecture serving as a frame for the sculpture. And for these reasons, the application of landscape studies, 3D scanning, 3D modeling, significantly extends our understanding of the bust, helping to recreate the forgotten spatial principles and their aesthetic repercussions in Picasso's concept. Thus, I strongly encourage art historians 
to use digital methods to virtually test research hypotheses and analyze factors that would otherwise have been difficult to track using traditional methods. And please contact me and our team at the Smart History Lab as we are happy to collaborate with you and um, help with you to start your journey. We can advise you uh, on how to virtually protect and study art and heritage. And I believe that with digitization and virtualization, we are the next generations of artisans of whom Picasso would be very enthusiastic. And we should be the helping hands to each other as once Nessier was to Picasso. Thank you for your attention.